welcome to Shoot 'Em Up. <laughs> the show where we witness the evolution of story from story to script to screen live. The show works in a three night process with one show a night spread out over three months. First, we see true stories told live. Those stories are then paired with screenwriters who have a month to go away and write short scripts based on the stories that they were paired with. Then we see live radio play style readings of those scripts, and those scripts are then randomly paired with directors who have a month to go away and make a short film based on or inspired by or with the script that they were paired with. So this is not something you can or will see anywhere else. Usually all we see is the finished product and not the process. So thank you for coming tonight for the second part of the process, the scripts. We've got an amazing show for you, so let's get started. Oh, oh I want to introduce our actors tonight. Uh, we have Ozioma Aka, Lance Barber, <clears throat> James Black, Michelle Miracle. Bill Ratner, Jihan Sabir, and Cricket Buckler. It, it's worth noting that Cricket is our producer, Gary Buckler's wife, so Hollywood nepotism is real. If you know the right people, you, you two could be in a reading at El Cid. So first up, we have Fugarse di Utopia by Donna Wheeler. Donna, could you come up, please? This was based on a story told by Kathy Lynn Yannick. Raised in a beautiful small town, Kathy dreams of moving to NYC, but her dreams quickly become a nightmare when she can't find a safe place to live. Okay, so Donna is going to pick her director, who's going to direct the film. Go ahead, Donna, here we go. Carissa San Jiren Sud Hikul. Yes, Carissa. Thank you. Donna, would you like to tell us a, a bit about what inspired you to write this script? Please take a mic, Donna. Thanks to all the actors for being here. Thank you. Okay, so yes. Um, now you get to be regaled about my process of writing this from Kathy's story. So I, um, the title, it's part of my script is in Spanish and parts in English, mostly in English. Un poquito en español. So the title A little is, bit in Spanish. That means a little bit in Spanish, thank you. Okay, yeah. so, the, so the Spanish title is Fugarse de Utopia, or Utop Utopia, and the English translation that I prefer is Escape from Utopia. So inspired by um, two movies, um, Little Miss Sunshine and um, Rosemary's Baby. So for those of you who haven't seen either of these movies, I don't know how you could be awake, but anyway, <laughs> um, Rosemary's Baby, the trajectory of the protagonist is basically she wants to find a safe place to live in New York and start a family with her loving husband. That's pretty much the, the through line of her character throughout. But she's always stopped by all these um, people with other agendas. Um, so that inspired me. And then Little Miss Sunshine, Olive's, the protagonist is Olive and her trajectory is finding herself and her sense of identity inside of her family unit. And they're all against that. They all have their own crazy agendas. Um, and then I use my own Latin family that lives in New York uh, and a little bit of my own films I've directed and some other screenplays I've written and came up with this adaptation of Kathy's story. So, yeah. Thank you, Donna. All right. Escape from Utopia.
Bless you. What a way to start, OZ. There we go. <laughs> OK, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Exterior fictional town, rural rolling hills of pastoral green, day. Super, Utopia, Pennsylvania, population 6,745. Off the beaten path, lovingly trapped in time. Puffy white clouds, blue skies, identical A-frame white clipboard homes, green lawns, kids, toys, a safe haven from dangerous urbanity. Interior utopia staged, talent show in, process, in progress, day. Magical glow reflecting from stage footlights, local audience members staring into camera, having the time of their lives, uproarious glee. If this were, were bottled, everyone would want some. Reverse point of view, 22-year-old Latinx Cecilia Bonilla on stage, equally gleeful, determined as fuck. Reveals Cece, outfitted in red plastic clown shoes, pink clown outfit, festive green bow, neon pink nose, and rainbow colored wig. She dances with utter conviction, clutching a pink balloon as a dance partner, stenciled eyes, cute nose, lips, matching <laughs> rainbow wig. Cece rocks it, twirls to a grand finale. Her balloon partner bursts. Older gentleman, Gustavo, who looks like Cece, her abuelo, grandpa, le leaps up to his feet, cheering exuberantly in Spanish. Crowd applauds wildly. Interior, Cece's living room, Utopia later. Cece on a couch, still in a clown outfit, best performance trophy next to her. On either side of her, doting mom, silent dad. Behind Cece, Gustavo. Mom does the talking. Me Tell me, my love. Everyone I waits breathlessly. I'm moving to New York City. Como? What the fuck? Nuevo York! No, New York no es bueno, not safe. Aquí es bueno, here is good. Cece crestfallen, Gustavo feeling pain in her heart, touches her shoulder. Mother stands, crosses arms. You belong in Utopia. Gustavo making a sign of a cross. Interior Cece's bedroom, Utopia, daybreak. Cece mourns alone in a black outfit and clown wig her trophy in the background. Gustavo enters her room, places a Peruvian torta dessert in front of her. Cece frowns, won't touch it. Gustavo clasps his hands to her chest, concerned. Interior Gustavo's bedroom, continuous. Gustavo prays in Spanish to a Spanish altar with framed photo of Cece and white candles atop his dresser. Exterior aerial shots day, New York City, in all its grandeur, glamor, and stark contrasts. Interior apartment hallway, Spanish Harlem, day. Gustavo speaks with Camacho, 50s, apartment manager, in a bright yellow, orange, red, green, teal shirt, gold chain, ponytail, jeans. Gustavo hands Camacho cash. They shake hands. Exterior apartment building, Spanish Harlem, continuous. Cece unloads her luggage and backpack from Gustavo's pickup truck. Gustavo exits building, broad grin, nodding yes. Sofa cushions rain down on them, followed by plastic folding chairs landing in the street behind them. Crash. Cece looks up. Fourth floor, fourth floor window. Additional items come flying out the window, bouncing onto the street. Cece grabs Gustavo's hand, and they huddle behind his truck. Latinx guy and girlfriend, 20s, lean out the fourth floor window. It's cool. We're just leaving. It's cool. <laughs> no palabras para tu madre. No words to your mother about this. See, si. Gustavo hands Cece apartment key, tearful hugs and goodbyes. Cece heads inside with her belongings, blowing kisses. Gustavo waves adios. Interior Cece Spanish Harlem apartment next morning. Birds chirping happily, sunshine for miles. Tranquility and peace. Cece unpacking her prized pink llama painted plates and her trophy. Stands back, admiring. Loud yelling from outside her window. She looks out, wide-eyed. Cece's point of view, a clunker car parked in front of her building. Two Latinx dudes fighting each other, punching, rolling on top of a car, yelling in Spanglish. Another scream, more shrill, more shrill. A woman's voice from down the street. Cece's alarmed. Her point of view, 60-year-old Spanish woman runs past, pursuing escaping teenage boy. Stop, ayúdame, my jewelry! Interior Cece's ap Harlem apartment, continuous. Cece quickly packs up her dishes and belongings. Split, split screen FaceTime phone call. Cece and Gustavo on the call. Gustavo reads from her handwritten post-it note. Available apartment with address. Abogado, lawyer, friend of a friend. Cece scribbles addresses on the back of her hand, determined. See, si. 
y no le digas a mamá. And no telling mom. Besitos. Kisses. Exterior Upper East Side, New York City Day. Cece on a mission. Lugs her belongings to the front door of a much improved upscale building in an upscale neighborhood. Buzzes, gets let inside. Interior lawyer sublet, front door, continuous. A wealthy 45-year-old attorney, Carol, in pearls, business suit, answers door. An NYC bar admission certificate framed in the background. Next to Carol, stuffed to the brim, a lawyer briefcase and wheeled suitcases. Carol hands Cece a key. Cece hands Carol $650 cash. I'll be back soon to get more of my things. Cece smiling. See? <laughs> and keep the answering machine on for my law firm's messages. Very important. See, si, claro. Into your bedroom, into your bathroom hallway, lawyer sublet night. Cece in a bathtub relaxing in a jet tub. Candlelight, painted toenails. Carol's home phone rings, triggering alarm, uh, answering machine. Carol, it's Bob. Hey, I just got out of Rikers Island, and I'm coming for you. Going to knife you up real good. Beep, dial tone. Cece gasp, hand over mouth, makes a sign of the cross. Interior, Lori Sublet, front door, foyer, night. Cece now dressed, hair wet, scrutinizing, security video feed of Carol's street. Cece's point of view, quiet, empty street. Sounds of phone ringing startles her. Cece answers her phone. Hello? Cupcake? Armando? Que tal? I know we just met this week, pero you can do a tiny favor for me? I see your text. Don't worry. I'm downstairs. Vamos. Exterior street lawyer sublet. Continuous. Cece struggling to lug her stuff, her, herself, her stuff onto the back of Armando's motorcycle. Armando, 40, Spanish soap star, Americanized, in black leather pants and jacket. Cowboy boots, colorful statement Chanel scarf, offers scant assistance. He revs his engine. They roar off into the night. A white van screeches up to the curb. Rough looking tatted dude, Bob, exits the van. 40s, shaved head, facial hair, outdated clothes. Buzzes Carol's apartment, no response. Damn it! I'm gonna get you, Carol! You can bet on it! Pissed, he hops back to the van. Emerges hauling a dusty chainsaw. Checks the gas tank, full. Carries a chainsaw to the entrance. Exterior Central Park West, moving. Armando and Cece riding the motorcycle, framed by full moon, racing through magical Central Park. Close on Cece, clutching Armando and her stuff, transfixed by the velvet sky and stars twinkling overhead. Exterior Armando's apartment building, Central Park West, morning. Trendy hipster street, trendy hipster neighborhood. Interior Armando's apartment, living room, continuous. Cece in a trendy chair, still in last night's clothes. Her belongings remain unpacked in the foreground. She looks around, cautious. Armando enters in a bathrobe, cowboy boots, different colored Chanel scarf, towel drying his dyed blonde hair. He reacts to her stuff, still unpacked. Hugs her awkwardly, she pulls away. It's safe here. Cece sussing him and it out. Stay, you mean? As long as needed, cupcake. Interior, Armando's apartment, living room later. Cece changes into her clean clothes, opposite style of Armando, though. Unpacking her plates and trophy onto Armando's trendy shelf. Armando bops in, excited, ready to go out. Different Chanel scarf, cowboy boots, leather jacket. Ah, uh, wait a second. Cece glances over to his shelf and her things. Cupcake, you are not wearing that, are you? Cece glances down. Rough, it looks fine to her. Unsure how to respond. See? No, 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 no. Armando now circles his shelf, eyeing her things there. And sugar puff, you're not putting this stuff here. I have certain decor to maintain. Cece, surveying his living room decor. It's not her jam. He's not her jam. Close on Cece. No jam here. <laughs> Exterior Central Park West. Bench, day. Cece, her belongings in tow, scrolls through recent calls. Several missed calls from Armando. Bites her lip, scrolls through our abuelo's number, stops herself, opens a new browser window. 
phone screen graph it, NYC apartment finder website. CC clicking on two search filters, video security and 24 hour doorman. Searching screen returns several successful hits. CC triumphant. Exterior apartment building, Upper West Side day, months later. Super cool, chill, safe neighborhood. Cece exits the lobby, greets the suited doorman. She hands him a not yet Broadway playbill. You and your wife on my guest list opening weekend. He gratefully accepts. Perfect, Miss Cece. She continues down street. Her phone rings. Gustavo, FaceTiming her. She answers. Como va, abuelito? Bueno, Cece. Tell mommy you were all on my guest list. Opening weekend. Ciao, ciao, pronto. End credits. Utopia. Who who thinks that that was a role that Monty was born to play? Okay, I'll take that as most of you. And I, I know I personally um, need a copy of that uh, message from Rikers about how he could knife you to death. That, that just seems to be like the outgoing message on my phone. Um, all right, next up we have Doing a Christiana by Shay E. Butler. Shay, would you like to come to the stage, please? Christiana has a crush on a fellow college student she barely knows, and one cold winter night while following him home from the bar is humiliated when she falls into a frozen over river. Stakes are high. Okay, Shay, who's your director gonna be? Uh, <laughs> SJ Main Luna. SJ! All right, Shay, would you like to tell us what inspired uh, your script? Please feel free to take a mic. Don't wanna. <laughs> Hi, so I'm Shay, and I got Christiana Carmine's story, and I just thought it was so very, very relatable because let's face it, I don't know anyone who hasn't had a crush on someone who didn't really know that you existed. And sometimes we've all just done some things we probably shouldn't have done to make them notice us. So <laughs> I just loved it. But then I also wanted to flip it on its ear a bit and give it a twist at the end. So I did, so I hope you all like it. Ooh, doing a Christiana. Doing a Christiana. Interior Murphy's Bar, night. Low end college bar, packed, noisy. Lisa, 21, sits alone, doodling on a paper napkin. She stares at Luther Scott, mid 20s, tall, handsome, fit, <laughs> playing pool with a blonde co ed. Girl, what's so important you drag my fine ass down here? Rose, over the top flamboyant and bundled in a winter jacket, plops down at Lisa's table. Lisa points to Luther. Him, my future husband. He's auditing Professor Jurgen's advanced lit class. Yummy, right? Rose holds up a Lisa's doodle. The napkin is covered with hearts drawn around the names Lisa and Luther. Is this the 911 skinny? Pathetic. I used to do this in grade school. Lisa and Luther. We even have the same initials. It's meant to be. <laughs> he does have one fine ass. I'll give you that. <laughs> I so have to meet him, Rose. Uh, uh, it's useless. He'll never notice me. I might as well be invisible. Then make yourself uninvisible, girl. Hey, that blonde's leaving. Go play pool with him. Lisa watches the blonde co-ed leave, then determined marches over to the pool table and picks up a pool cue. I'm next. And, um, I'm Lisa. I'll break. Luther lines up the shot. Bam! The cue ball cracks into the rack balls and they scatter, dropping into the pockets. Luther quickly runs the table, then walks off without a word. Uh, thanks for the game. She stares after him, deflated. Exterior Riverside Coffee Shop Day, a popular coffee shop on the banks of a frozen river. 
Students in winter clothes sit under propane heaters. Lisa, holding a latte, spies on Luther sitting alone at a table reading a book. Finally, she crosses to the table. Excuse me. It's crowded and there's nowhere to sit. Do you mind? He grabs his backpack and dumps it on the empty chair. Actually, I do. It's taken. Humiliated, Lisa blindly turns away. She bumps into the blonde co-ed, spilling her latte all over herself. Exterior college campus parking lot another afternoon. Lisa on her bike watches Luther lock his pickup truck, then disappear down a jogging trail. She video chaps with Rose. Her cell's in a holder attached to her bike handlebars. I'm going to follow him, fall and pre pretend to twist my ankle. He'll have to help me, uh, maybe even drive me to the emergency room. This is so not a good idea. Girl, you know how your sister never thinks before she acts? I am not my sister. You are so doing a Christiana. <sighs> Exterior jogging path afternoon. Lisa pedals after Luther jogging ahead of her on a narrow trail. On her sail, we see her video chap is still live. Let me see, let me see. Lisa stops and switches the camera view forward to show the path in front of the bike, but the path is now empty. <gasps> Damn, where, where'd it go? She pedals furiously around the corner just as Luther reappears jogging straight at her. Startled, she jerks her bike to the side to avoid the collision and does a header into the bush. Oof. We see her fall via video chat. Lisa! Lisa, you all right? Lisa! On the cell's chat screen, Lisa's head pops up, twigs and leaves sticking out of her helmet, dirt smudged on her face. Behind her jogging, the blonde co-ed approaches. There's no sign of Luther. The blonde rushes over to Lisa. Exterior movie theater night. Lisa and Rose ex uh, exit a theater with other students. The marquee reads, rear window. The blonde co-ed with several girlfriends also exit the theater. Behind her, Luther. No lightsabers, no superheroes. Ugh, I can't believe you made me sit through that movie for a guy. You have to got, you've got to give it up. Hey, do I know you? Luther's blocking their way. Lisa's startled. Uh, no, I mean, yes. It's Lisa from the bar. We played pool, and, and we're both in Professor Jurgen's advanced lit class. We almost sat together at, coffee, at the coffee shop this morning. Are you stalking me? Maybe I should call the police. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I guess we're just interested in the same things. I doubt it. He walks off, leaving a humiliated Lisa behind. I am not stalking him. Yeah, you kind of are. <laughs> oh, God. I can't face him again. I, I'm going to have to drop Professor Jurgen's class. But I can't graduate this semester without it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What am I going to do? Exterior deserted street, dead-end alley, night. Lisa rides her bike down the street, video chatting with Rose. I'm fine. And no, I'm almost home. I don't need an Uber. <gasps> oh, my God. She spots Luther's truck parked in a dead-end alley. It's Luther's truck. He must live in an apartment around here. I have to apologize. You are one crazy-ass woman. What are you going to do? Knock on every door till you find him? No, no. I'll just leave a note on his windshield. Then I won't have to drop out of advanced lit. She pulls a notebook out of her backpack, scribbles a fast note, then runs to the pickup truck. As she slips the note under the wiper, the back door to the building opens. It's Luther. She ducks behind the truck. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. He can't find me here. He can't. Luther props the door open, then disappears inside. Lisa dashes toward the street, but Luther, carrying something heavy, backs out the door. With no place to hide, Lisa scrambles into the back of the pickup and hides under a large tarp. She curls up into, the ti into a tiny ball against the back of the cab. Lisa hears grunting and a squeal of the tailgate opening. She peeks out and stifles a scream. Luther dumps a body on the tailgate and rolls it up <laughs> under the other end of the tarp, then slams the tailgate shut. Under the tarp, frozen, Lisa stares into the eyes of the dead blonde co-ed. <laughs> Suddenly, the truck takes off. Exterior, deserted road near the river, night. The truck zooms down the road, then slows and turns onto the dirt track leading into the woods. Exterior woods near the riverbank, night. Luther drives up and parks near a pre-dug grave at the top of a steep bank above the frozen river. 
He gets out and opens the tailgate. He flips the edge of the tarp up and grabs the body. He awkwardly picks it up and heads toward the grave. Under the tarp, Lisa's petrified. She finally peeks out and sees Luther dump the body into the grave. He grabs a shovel off the, gra off the ground and starts slinging dirt into the grave. Quietly, Lisa slithers over to the side of the truck. Crack! Lisa stands on a, sta lands on a dry branch and it snaps, the sound echoing. Luther whirls around and spots Lisa. She bolts. Luther takes off after her. Racing along the bank, Lisa trips and tumbles down the steep bank. Her body lands on the ice, slides across it. With a loud crack, the ice breaks and Lisa plunges into the icy water. She frantically tries to crawl out, but the ice keeps breaking under her flailing limbs. Luther looks down at her from the top of the bank. Well, lucky who we have here. Our very own stalker. How classic. The stalker has a stalker. <laughs> Must be the universe's perverse little joke. Tried ignoring you, being rude, even tried humiliating you in front of your friend. You just didn't get the message. Not very smart for a college girl. But not many of you are. Easy prey. Please. Please, I, I, I won't tell. Just, just help me. I'm, I'm freezing. She tries to pull herself out of the water, but the ice keeps breaking beneath her. She plunges back into the water. Oh, I know. Makes my life easier. No need to dig another grave. And besides, each of my girls deserves their own resting place. G girls? She's not... Th the only one? No. I think she's... Uh, let me see. I think... Uh, Number nine. Nine? Oh, my God. A new university, a new name. Fake IDs are pretty easy to come by. When you audit a class, no one knows you're there. You're invisible. Please, please, I don't want to die. Well, you have about you know, five minutes before hypothermia sets in. Five more, and adios to your pathetic, meaningless life. So sad. Too bad. He turns and walks away. Lisa mutters to herself. Oh, I am not pathetic. And I'm not going to die. Not going to happen. She spots a tree branch sticking out of the ice. She lunges and grabs it. Lisa pulls her body out of the water, but the ice breaks, plunging her back into the freezing water. Oh, shit! Think, Lisa. Think. Think. Dis displacement of body weight. Lisa holds the branch and rolls one leg onto the ice. It holds. She pulls her left leg, left side up again. Again, the ice holds. That's it, Lisa. Slowly, slowly. Lisa's body slips onto the ice. She lies flat, spread eagle, dispersing her weight. Lisa breaks a piece off of the branch, drives it into the ice like a climbing baton, and pulls herself forward. She drives up again, pulls again, pulls Lisa slides to the shore and crawls onto the solid ground. Luther finishes filling the grave and tosses the shovel aside. He starts spreading brush over the grave. Lisa crawls closer. She lunges to her feet, grabs the shovel, and bam! She slams the shovel against Luther's head. He falls, rolls down the bank onto the ice, and slides into Lisa's hole. L Luther sinks. He struggles to the surface and tries to pull himself out of the river, but the ice breaks. He plunges back into the freezing water. Lisa stares down at him from the bank as he struggles to get out. Help, help me. You got, you got to help me. Please. Please help me. So sad. Too bad. Lisa watches as Luther sinks beneath the icy water and disappears from sight. A beat. Then she turns and walks away. Doing a Christiana. Wow, who who saw that that turn from like house bunny to like horror film? Anyone? Um that I, I feel like that the real message of this script is like if you have an unrequited crush on a guy, he probably is a murderer. <laughs> I also like how in real life what would have actually happened if, you know, he was he was dying at the end is that she would have rescued him and, and then, like, married him and then, like, been surprised when he, like, killed their daughter. Um, 
I, I definitely have never had an unrequited crush. I don't know what that's like. <laughs> I definitely didn't spend all of my adolescence in love with a guy named Lee Frodison. I definitely didn't shave an L in the back of my head. And I definitely never went to his house uninvited and threw um, water balloon condoms at him inexplicably and then left. <laughs> Next up, we have Sito by Julia Carnara. Julia, do you want to come to the stage, please? This is based on a story told by Elaine Strutz. Absolutely loves her Sito, Arabic for grandma, and wants to be her favorite grandchild, but those hopes are quelled when she is visiting her Sito and finds a neighborhood kid has adopted her as her Sito as well. What a bitch. <laughs> Julia, who's your director going to be? Oh. 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 Foster Wilson? Foster Wilson! <laughs> Would you like to tell us what inspired your script? I can tell that you do because yeah, you, you, I'm, I'm so you very took a <laughs> stationary <laughs> mic out of <laughs> and the I mic stand. My own. I'm going to perform. I don't know where you think you're going with that mic. It's I have no idea. <laughs> literally wrapped around the pole. Go I, ahead, Julia. I don't know. I think I'm going to sing a song uh, okay. about my script. I have no idea. Uh, what I think what really got me about Elaine's story is the fact that I had a similar experience with my grandparents. Uh, one time I went to visit them and there were pictures of this little boy and I'm like, who the fuck is this? And they're like, oh, it's the neighbor kid. He's like the grandchild we never had. And I'm like, what the fuck am I then, you know? Um, well, the sad story is that that kid has now moved away and they're depleted. He of, died. You know, no, no. He's alive and well. He's just living in a different city. His parents got divorced. It's very sad. I feel, I feel, I feel bad for the boy now, mm. even though I was kind of jealous. Mm. Um, I was also, uh, I think, an adult with my own child at the time. So it's funny that I was jealous. That my grandparents had that, like an honorary grandchild. It's That's like, disrespectful. What about me? Yeah. And, like, loved my kid, you know, anyways. Um, so, yeah, so that's really what, like, at the core of it, that's what really got me about the story. So, there you go. Enjoy. All right. Sito. Fade in. Interior minivan moving day. The children occupy the back seat. The oldest, 10, the only boy, sits on the left side. Elaine, 8, sits in the middle. The youngest, 6, a mischievous-looking girl, is on the right side. Elaine shifts in her seat, cramped, uncomfortable. Why do I always have to sit in the middle? In the front seat, Mom, 30s, and Dad, 30s, are already annoyed at this exchange. Do we have to do this every time? Mom speaks under her breath. <laughs> I know one day you're going to miss this. Dad sighs, trying to dodge the fight. Elaine sees the exchange. As a way to defuse the bomb, she rests her head on her brother's shoulder. Ma, get off! Ma, she's doing it again! Stop! Yeah, she's doing it again! Elaine shoots her a look. Settle down, everyone. We're almost there. Tell her not to feed him a bunch of junk this time. Like she'd listen. Elaine notices the exchange. Exterior street, East Dearborn Day. Arab town. The minivan parks in front of Sito's house. Sito, 60s, sits on the porch. She's a plus-size woman rocking a muumuu and hijab. <laughs> the years of raising children, working, and carrying the extra weight have taken a toll on her. She's warm and kind like any other beloved grandma. Mom gets out of the minivan. She opens the door, and the kids rush out and race towards Sito. Slow down. All three of them hug her at once. She basks in the attention. Let me look at you so much bigger than the last time. Sito turns her attention to Mom. Hi, Mom. The two women hug. Be back by five. She turns around to leave, stops in her tracks. Not too much sugar, okay? Sito nods. Mom is not convinced as she walks to the minivan. Brother and sister scurry inside. Elaine lingers. Once they're out of earshot... Uh, Sito, can, can I be your favorite? Okay, Yenny. <laughs> cool. Elaine runs inside. Sito goes back to her spot on the porch. Interior Sito's house, downstairs, day. Old lady house vibes with knickknacks, family photos, and old furniture. Elaine runs upstairs. Her siblings can be heard playing upstairs. The hallway alone tells you only children roam this part of the house. 
There are pictures, piles of magazines, comic books, and a few broken toys all covered in a layer of dust. Elaine goes into one of the bedrooms. Her siblings are not inside. It's a mess of trinkets and junk, just like the hallway. Pictures, letters, old boxing equipment, all covered in a layer of dust. Elaine stops in her tracks and takes in the room. Something's not right. To the untrained eye, a mess is a mess, but Elaine notices things seem to be out of place. Old photos are stuck to windows with chewing gum. Glass in picture frames has been shattered. Trophies were on the floor positioned in pairs as if slow dancing with one another. A noise catches Elaine's attention. A little girl, six, runs out from behind the dirty sofa and takes off toward the hallway. Come back here! Guys! Guys, come here! Come help! Elaine chases her. Interior bathroom, day. Just as messy as the rest of the upstairs. Elaine approaches slowly, shaking, as nervous as if she were about to slay a dragon. Inside the bathtub, the top of the little girl's head can be seen. She's shaking, too, maybe giggling a little. Not Elaine. To her, this is as serious as it can be. What are you doing in my Sito's house? The little girl pops out of the tub, startling Elaine with her loudness and urgency. This is my Sito's house! Elaine doesn't buy it. What's Sito's name, then? It's just Sito. That doesn't make any sense. She has a real name. What is it? Tell me, or I'm calling my brother. A little girl's holding a trophy, a basketball player with his head broken off. Elaine sees it. That's mine. The little girl looks at the trophy and back at Elaine, confused. It used to be my uncle, Nimer, who played in the game of the century with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Do you even know who that is? Yeah. Some Arabic guy? Yeah. Ha-ha! <laughs> Got you. He's not Arab. He just converted to Islam. Whatever. The little girl puts down the trophy and scurries out of the bathroom, bored with the exchange. Elaine picks up the prized possession and walks out of the bathroom. She sees the little girl disappear downstairs. Elaine goes looking for her siblings. Guys! Interior, another bedroom day. Another messy room. Elaine's brother and sister are engaged in other activities. He's reading some old comic books, and she's arranging a collection of coins, buttons, and broken jewelry. Elaine's brother and sister look up at her. Who was that? Some little girl took my trophy. She shows the item victorious. Why didn't you come help me? He shrugs. The sister doesn't even look up from her collection. Elaine approaches them. Can I play? No answer. Exterior Sito's house, porch, day. Elaine walks out of the house. She's still clutching the trophy. Sito and the little girl are engaged in a conversation in Arabic while they play cards. The monster is coming! She's not a monster. No, she's an angry bear. The little girl roars for maximum emphasis. <laughs> Sito lets out a little laugh. Elaine watches them for a beat. The betrayal and jealousy she's feeling are clear on her face. There's something about Sito's laugh that drives her over the edge. Go fish! Okay, ya Amy. Elaine can't help herself. That's my Sito! The little girl turns into a beast. She slams her cards on the table and yells. No, she's my Sito! The little girl grabs the trophy from Elaine's arms and takes off running across the street. Elaine calls out to her siblings. Guys, she's stealing! Yeah, Amy, let her play. Fade out. Fade back in. <laughs> the little girl stops in her tracks as her face goes pale. A woman, the little girl's mother, marches toward her. The family resemblance is clear. The mother is livid. Fatma! Out in the daylight, the little girl's unkempt appearance is noticeable. She has dirt on her face and is wearing a filthy dress. Her mother grabs her arm, causing the little girl to drop the trophy. The metal hits the pavement with a clang. The mother drags her home, kicking and screaming while hitting her with a shoe. Elaine clutches her Sito's arm. She moves into an embrace, burying her tear-covered face into Sito's chest. Sito soothes her for a few beats. Sito starts to steer the embrace inside. Elaine takes a step toward the front door. She stops and frees herself from Sito's embrace. Elaine runs to the street and picks up the trophy. She places it carefully on the sidewalk in front of Sito's house. Elaine runs back to Sito. Elaine takes one last look at the trophy. She wraps her arms around her Sito 
and the two of them walk out, fade out. Cito. No need to comment on my star turn as mother. I think my performance speaks for itself. Um, I'm so glad, Julia, that you used Elaine's line from her story where she said, can I be your favorite? So that's what I'm just going to turn my Tinder bio into. That's just all it's going to say. I feel like that the grown-up version of this is like, when you have a guy and on Instagram, you could see his activity <laughs> and you can see that he's like, likes the posts of, you know, like some like Instagram ho who posts pictures of her naked behind and then like puts like a roomy quote, like she knows who fucking roomy is. She didn't pull it off Pinterest. And you're like, who fuck is that? And he's like, don't worry about it. Anyways. <laughs> Next up, we have Mine by Shilpa Menkikar. Shilpa, do you want to come to the stage, please? This is based on a story told by Melissa Fitzsimmons. Yes. When Melissa's overworked mom leaves her and her sister with a new member of their community, they are drugged and in the middle of the night taken to a cave where they are held for days till Melissa gets an opportunity to save her sister and herself. All right, Shilpa, who's your director going to be? Kate Carson. Yes! <laughs> Shilpa, would you like to tell us what inspired your script? Yeah, this script was... Well, the original story by Melissa was really moving and um, dangerous, and it had all the perfect elements. So first I was like, maybe I should just, you know, stick to the story. But then um, I was talking to a friend about Me Too and, like, if there are no witnesses or justice in a story... And she was like, oh, well, I wish I could go back and change some things. So then I tried to add some of those elements to the story. And then another friend was looking for women who are action directors, so I added some action to it. And <laughs> also, I've actually been hiking in that location, so I added like the, the amazing scenery and um, made the characters more earthy and connected to nature. And then I asked Melissa what she wanted, and she said to turn it into a comedy, but I was like, that's really totally not <laughs> going to work. But I added some levity here and there to it. And I, also, I have a sister, so I related to that relationship. So, yeah. Very layered, okay. Shilpa. All right, mine! Interior ghost mine, day. The screen is pitch black. A little girl whispers. 101, 102. One and three. In the dark, we can barely see small, dirty fingers clutching the rough rock wall as she climbs up. Bats hang upside down. Chrissy shrieks. What did Grandpa tell you? Exterior, ghost mine, day. The clouds burn the sky. Reveal. The voice belongs to May, age 10, mixed race, spunky, and natural leader. Her freckles are amplified <laughs> in the hot sun. She's followed by her daughter, Chrissy, or rather her sister, Chrissy, seven, Trusting and innocent, mixed race, dark skin. Chrissy's blonde hair is tied into afro puffs. They climb out of the mine cave into the bright desert sun. May adjusts her eyes. They're in the base of a deep red canyon. Redstone pinnacles reach up to the sky. Ribbons of red earth flow along the landscape. This is what Mars must look like. It's silent. There are two soft creatures in the unforgiving desert. They have coal soot all over their faces and clothes. Don't tell Mama. She's gonna figure it out. They start walking. There's no one in sight. Red sand clouds up, and they run and dance. Soon their legs are covered in red dust. They reach a river. Time almost stops for the river's slow and steady current. Chrissy is scared. She wades in up to her knees, wavering. May splashes her. Just swim like a turtle. Two turtles swim up next to Chrissy. The turtles flank Chrissy and show her how to swim. Chrissy holds her breath in her cheeks and follows the turtles across the river. Exterior tourist trail day. They finally reach a tourist trail where a tourist man and tourist woman fuss with a map. Tourist man, 45, Indian, ate too much jerky. And tourist woman, 45, Indian, 
the most delicate thing in the desert, wears a sari and white sneakers. You're so little. You don't even know how to whistle. Yes, I do. Me whistles loudly. The tourist man thinks they're whistling at him. His wife is shocked. Chrissy tries to whistle, but the sound comes out weak. Ha! <laughs> I told ya! Uh, yeah, um, yeah. can you tell me where the old general store is? Me and Chrissy lead the tourists back to signs of human civilization. Exterior general store day. A recreated Wild West town. The tourist man and woman buy ice pops for me and Chrissy. Jane, 45, a mysterious red-headed woman, watches them lick the ice pops. Exterior trailer park. Grandpa's trailer day. Grandpa, 70, handicapped, hippie, Vietnam veteran, Caucasian, smokes a bowl and barely notices the shouting kids. He's in a wheelchair. Diane, mama, 35, young and toughened by hard work, Caucasian, blonde and tanned by the desert. Diane, mama, spoon feeds grandpa rice and beans between his toques. Diane looks up, furious. Interior trailer kitchen, Diane's trailer, night. The girls have cleaned up now. Diane, mama, spanks May. I told you never to go down there. Me and Chrissy both have mama's green eyes. The light goes out of May's eyes for a second. Suddenly a knock on the screen door. Diane looks up. Jane, the red-headed woman. Diane pushes May off her lap. Now, now don't give... Wait, what, what's your name again? The red-headed woman says something, but May runs past her into the bedroom. You hear me? Don't give her any trouble. They're good girls, I swear. Interior trailer bedroom night. A king-sized bed. May hides her face in the pillow. May wipes tears from her eyes. Chrissy puts her head on May's back. May pushes her off. Why did you go and tell her? I didn't. Interior trailer kitchen night. Mama touches the post-it on the cupboard. Here's my number at the saloon. I'll be back at 2 a.m. after the bar closes. I'll have cash for you. Diane pulls the girls off the bed and puts them in front of two bowls of spaghetti and blue Gatorade. Chrissy eats quietly. May doesn't touch her food. Jane, the red-headed woman, watches them. Diane tries to give May a kiss. May shrugs her off, sulking. Diane starts to step out the door. Thanks for coming last minute like that. I really owe you one. I really appreciate it. You know. Diane closes the screen door. Exterior trailer park night. Most of the lights are off, but the moon is very bright. May smells hair. Her feet are off the ground. Is this a dream? Someone is carrying her. She feels arms under her butt and back. Mama must be back. May opens her eyes. It's red hair. It doesn't smell like Mama. Where's my mom? The red-haired woman puts May in the back of a pickup truck. The engine is running. There are dirty blankets. Chrissy is already there, sleeping. Go to sleep. We're taking you to your mom. It's a surprise. The red-headed lady hops into the pickup truck cabin. The light flickers on. May looks through the pickup window at the driver. He's a huge man with a beard. A scream is stuck in her throat. <laughs> May looks over the edge of the pickup. She's frenzied. Their trailer home moves farther into the distance as the pickup drives off. Soon the home lights fade into the desert moonlight. A coyote howls. May closes her eyes and thinks hard. Two coyotes come running out of the darkness behind the pickup truck. May looks the coyote in the eyes. The coyotes run along the pickup truck. May can jump, but Chrissy's still sleeping. The pickup truck speeds too fast. The coyotes are left behind in the dust. Interior ghost mine, night. The air is cold and stagnant. May coughs up brown phlegm. May opens her eyes. There's one candle in a makeshift table. Mama? May jumps up from a dirty blanket and runs toward the candle. But it isn't Mama. It's the red-haired woman and the big man. May steps back. Where are they? The dark ceiling is so low, if she jumps, she can touch it. Some parts could fall at any moment. May sees sharp, jagged rocks everywhere. A rusty broken railroad track, a rusty coal bin, water drips. About 300 feet away, at a steep angle, May recognizes the mine entrance. May realizes they're back in the mine deeper than before, and the red-haired lady is between them and the cave exit. May looks around for her sneakers, but doesn't see them. Mom's coming. Are you thirsty? May backs up, but she is thirsty. She nods yes. Here. The red-haired lady gives May a blue drink in a dusty glass. It looks like Gatorade. The blue drifts into black. May blacks out. Interior ghost mine day. May wakes up again, delirious. Everything is blurry and stretchy. 
This time, a single ray of light cuts through the darkness from somewhere high above. The exit. May squints her eyes. She doesn't feel Chrissy around her. She scans the room quickly. May spots Chrissy's hair. Chrissy is tightly curled up on a blanket on the floor. May looks down. She's sitting in her underwear in a chair. The big man stares through May's skin. What the hell? Where are my clothes? You and your filthy mouth. It's breakfast time. Your clothes were dirty. You were dirty, dirty girls. The red-haired lady starts putting May's shirt back on her. I can do it. Red-haired lady puts a plastic bowl of cereal in front of May and Chrissy. Chrissy droops onto the cereal bowl but doesn't eat. Chrissy tries to whistle again. I want to go home. I don't like this. Your mom told me to take care of you until she gets back. She must have forgotten about you. I want to go home! The big man gets up, pulling his belt off. His shadow looms on the cave wall. I'm going to kill you if you don't shut up. May lunges. She must protect Chrissy at all cost. May's nails dig into the big man's thick, hairy flesh. She kicks him hard between his legs. The big man smacks May down. He grabs May by the throat against the sharp cave wall. Her legs dangle. She kicks, but he's four times as big as she. He smells like beer and sweat. May claws at him. Her face starts turning red, then blue. Chrissy whistles. Chrissy closes her eyes deeply and whistles again. The bats fly down and attack the big man. They bite his face. He screams. Chrissy whistles again. Bats attack the red-haired lady. She rolls on the ground in pain. A final bat swoops down and slices the big man's throat, clean across. His throat erupts like a bloody faucet. The red-haired lady screams as the bats bite her. Chrissy! Chrissy runs to May. They hold hands. It's still very dark in the cave. If they run and climb towards the light, they may make it out. The red-haired lady gets up. She stumbles towards them. They scurry up the dark, sharp stones, barefoot, barely lit. The stones are sharp and pointy. Their feet are scratched and bleeding, but they have to run. The red-haired lady drags herself up towards them. May kicks her in the face. She rolls towards the edge of the stairs and grabs Chrissy's leg. Chrissy grabs a rusty railroad track. May kicks the red-haired lady off. The red-haired lady falls into the darkness, landing in the cave with a smack. They climb higher and higher, counting. Now they're back near the mine entrance where they started. What did Grandpa tell you? To be brave. They run out into the light. Mine! That'll be a um, really easy job for the director of that film. Really easy to make that on a low budget. The visual effects. Children getting beat up. Onset tutor. So, next up we have Lourdes by Sarah Bouillon. Sarah, if you'd like to approach the stage. This is based on a story told by Uzma Kang. When Uzma's parents hire a live-in housekeeper from Latin America, things go from weird to life-threatening when the housekeeper's PTSD from the civil war she escaped causes to attack family members with knives she's hidden all throughout the house. Sarah, who will your director be? Oh, I can't wait. Don't suck, don't suck. Jen Page. Jen Page! Here's Noah Stock. Sarah, would you like to tell us what inspired your script? Um, well, the story inspired my script. Um, and it was actually, I mean, the, the story was pretty linear. It had all these amazing pieces and parts, and it was basically just a, a puzzle. All the pieces were there. Um, but I couldn't figure out how to make it scary in five pages, so I kind of diddled with the um, timeline a little bit. And then I... It was hard. Okay. All right. Long story. I, <laughs> the other writer dropped out. I slid in. I had like four oh, days to like drama. crank out. I know, right? <laughs> I had like four days to crank out a script. Yeah. So take that into account. And it's red. Um, so... And then I was just, so, uh, so I wrote it, and then I was like, oh, this would be so much better if it was from, from her perspective, like, rewrite the whole fucking thing. So I wasn't going to do that, 
So, but then I had a little brainstorm about the end, and I think it came out pretty cool. And I've never done this before. I've never not had control of my own writing. So this is, this is awkward. <laughs> okay, well, we really we look forward to this script. Thank you for Sarah. having me. Lourdes. Fade in, black, a door creaks. Interior, Aria home, Lakshmi's bedroom, pre-dawn. Day one, October 21st. Lakshmi Arya, 16, goth, jet black hair, preternaturally self-absorbed, asleep, drooling, rouses. She peels her eyes open and rolls over. Her bedroom door is ajar. A soft light pours in from the hallway, illuminating her Halloween decorations. Lakshmi snorts and collapses back asleep. Interior, Arya home, Lakshmi's bedroom, dawn. The shower rushes from the bathroom off her, off her room, waking Lakshmi again. She takes her phone, 5 a.m. Motherfucker. She groans and pulls her pillow over her head. Exterior, interior, Aria home, front door, dusk. Day 10, Halloween. Halloween decorations adorn the front of the house. On the step is a pumpkin with a horrified expression carved into it and a knife jammed into its ear. Lakshmi steps past it and bangs on the front door. Incongruously, Water is pouring out from underneath it. God damn it, open the door, Lourdes! Through the window of the door, a very small woman, Lourdes, Latina, 60s, presses her face against the glass and waggles her finger at Lakshmi. No, 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 no. Come on, please, please. Lourdes disappears from the window. Lakshmi turns to the driveway. Her brother, Arnav, Arnie, 17, tightly wound, and her father, Abe, 40s, harried, hurry from the family car. Daddy, the door's locked and she won't open it. This is stupid. What the fuck? Arnie bounds up the walk and shoves her. Move, dummy. Do you have dad's keys? Of course I got the dad's keys. What am I, stupid? Move. Lakshmi shoves him back. You move. Give me the keys. No, you move. 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 Knock it off. Move. Don't talk to me you, like you that. You just move. They're splashing around in the water. Lakshmi refuses to give ground, and Arnie tries to box her out, pushing her with his ass, basketball style, so he can get the key in the door. Knock it off, dummy. From inside. Move. Lourdes is howling. No, no, no! Arnie bursts in the door and bolts up the stairs, following the flow of water. Interior, Arya home, foyer, continuous. Lakshmi pulls out her phone and then plugs herself in. She follows Arnie in and up the stairs. Wedged between the wall and the open front door, unnoticed, Lourdes is wild-eyed and nearly panting. No. Interior, Arya home, kitchen, day. Day eight, October 29th. Arnie sits at the breakfast table, eating cereal out of a mixing bowl and reading the back of the cereal box. Lakshmi shuffles in, dressed for school, but barely awake. Finally. Oh, stick it, nerd. Hurry up and eat. We're going to be late. Again. Again. Lighten up. Lakshmi trundles over to the fridge and gets out an apple. She reaches for the knife block, but all the knives are gone. Huh? Every single knife in the dish rack all shiny and clean. She chooses one and cuts up her apple. Lourdes blows into the kitchen, arms full of laundry. She sees the kids watching her and starts. She ducks her head and scampers out. Morning, Lourdes. See, si, see. Si. There she goes. How long has she been up? Since she woke me up taking a shower at five of fucking clock again. Every morning. Well, she's a great worker. This house has never been cleaner, and Mom had to tell her to stop working last night. Tell her. You could learn a thing or two from her. Mm, yeah, Lakshmi yeah. gives him a look of death and flips him off. Charming. I'll be in the car, dickhead. Oh, yeah. Dickhead. Lakshmi takes her apple and heads out. Interior, Aria home, foyer, same. 
Lakshmi heads to the front door, but stops at a potted plant. She reaches her hand into it and pulls out a carving knife. Moron. She replaces the knife in the plant and heads out the door. Interior, Arya home, Lakshmi's bedroom, day. Day six, October 27th. Lakshmi lounges on her bed, earbuds in, scrolling through Twitter. Her head bounces to the beat of her music. Thud. A little bit of dust drops from the ceiling onto her phone, the only way she would notice. She takes out her earbuds. Thud, thud. She stares at the ceiling. More thudding. She gets up and goes to the hallway. Interior, Arya home. Hallway attic access, day. Lakshmi stares up the staircase into the black void of the attic. Lourdes! The thudding stops. Nothing. Lourdes! Are you up there? Lourdes' head pops out. See, I am here. What are you doing? I am here. <laughs> what are you doing? I will come down. Lourdes' head disappears. Lakshmi waits. Lourdes' head reappears. She looks disappointed when she sees Lakshmi's still there. Her head disappears again. Lourdes reappears and descends the stairs. She's carrying two of the family's decorative swords and a bucket of water. She gets to the bottom and nods to Lakshmi, clearly stressed. Okay, thank you. I go. It's fine. Everything is okay. Lourdes takes the swords and the bucket of water downstairs. Interior, Arya home, Lakshmi's bedroom, day. Day three, October 24th. Lourdes' raucous laughter is heard coming from the bathroom off screen. It stops. Lakshmi cruises into her room and chucks her backpack on her bed. Laughter again. Lakshmi smiles and crosses to the bathroom. Interior, exterior, Arya home, Lakshmi's bathroom, continuous. Lakshmi peeks around the open door. Lourdes is standing stock still, staring at herself in the mirror, alone. There's nothing funny happening. The laughter is not raucous, it's maniacal. Lakshmi grimaces, backs up slowly, and disappears. Interior, Arya home, foyer, day. Day 10, Halloween. Lakshmi reappears at the upstairs landing. The water has stopped. Her father, Abe, rushes in. Daddy, I... Lourdes steps from behind the door. She whips the butcher's knife over her head. She's got a knife! Lourdes lunges for Abe, who instinctively jumps away. He grabs at her, trying to secure her flailing arm. Lakshmi bolts down the stairs and grabs for Lourdes' other arm. She's incredibly strong for such a tiny old woman. Abe is able to wrench the knife from Lourdes, but she launches Lakshmi against the wall. No! With her arms now free, Lourdes grabs the knife blade, slicing her hand open. Blood flies everywhere. Arnie res resurfaces. I, I got Clues. the water off. It, it, what the hell's going on? Who, whose blood is that? Dad, stop! Call the police. Hurry! G give it back. It's mine. She's not safe. Demon, devil, I'll kill you all! Please, y yes, hurry, hurry. My dad, it, there's so much blood. Yes, yes, yeah, 2416 Palm Grove. Please, yes, hurry, please. Abe throws the knife to the floor in Lakshmi's direction. Get rid of it! Lakshmi disappears with it into another room. Lourdes is flailing and screaming, but Abe finally has control of her arms. Lakshmi runs back in the room with a purple, sparkly jump rope. Her father looks up at her. What? It's all I can find! Get over here! Exterior, Aria, home, night. The lights from cop cars and ambulances illuminate confused trick-or-treaters. This is either terrifying or the best haunted house ever. Arnie, Abe, and Lakshmi, covered in blood and profoundly shaken, are broken off given, giving their accounts to police officers. EMTs roll Lourdes by, strapped to a gurney. Her hand is heavily bandaged. She's sedated, straining against the straps, and mumbling about demons and God. Lourdes' point of view. As she's being loaded into the ambulance, Lourdes' vision goes in and out. It comes into focus. Lourdes sees the family talking to the cops. They blur out. They come back into focus. But they're all demons, all talons and fangs and evil. No! Dios mío, lo siento, lo siento. Lo intente, lo intente. 
are these her delusions? Or does she and only she see them for how they really are? The Abbe demon turns and meets Lourdes's stare. He smiles at her and winks. Lourdes moans loudly. They load her into an ambulance and slam the door on her protestations. Fade to black. Lourdes. Another very easy script to execute for the director. My mom is always like calling me from Indonesia, complaining to me about her maid problems. I'm just gonna send her the script and I'm gonna say, you got, you got nothing to complain about. All right, you ready for your final script of the evening? It's Astral Quest by CM Landris. CM, do you wanna to come to the stage? This is based on a story told by Kimberly Jensen. Growing up in Scotland where everyone is white and the same, her mom never could believe that gay people were real until she learns that her church, no, wrong? <laughs> that, that sounds like something I would write. Um, well, uh, CM, yeah. Nope. Uh, I, well, I can pick my director. Yeah, pick your director. <laughs> Trisha Lee! Woo! Um, well, I can, uh, obviously it's based on Kimberly's story, and Kimberly is, uh, in her story, processing grief of her mother during an illness when she's a child. She does it through um, entering a kite competition and building a kite and ultimately winning. Um, so her story was very, uh, kind of lended itself to um, both uh, a range of emotions, and so I kind of took that and ran with it. Um, I, uh, I think compared to the other writers, I may have taken a few more liberties than some, um, but uh, so I was obviously inspired by that, and I have a trauma-informed background, so I'm very interested in how children process grief, so I wanted to do something solely from the perspective of a child, um, processing this grief in her own way. Um, we tend to think that kids don't understand, but the reality is they absorb everything and figure it out for themselves. And then I was also very inspired by our own Ligeria Davis, who is working on representation in the media with her film, Black Barbie, blackbarbie.com. Um, blackbarbiefilm.com, blackbarbiefilm.com. And uh, so I, it was, I'm Fifty Shades of White, and as far as I know, uh, Kimberly is also very white. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we had uh, a woman of color at the center of our story and that she was seeing herself reflected and that helps her process her grief as well. Um, so that's what it's about. All right, Astral Quest. Interior award room day. The time is just a bit in the future. Off screen, the chatter of an excited full house. There's a podium in the front of the room with NASA on it. A mixed-race woman, late 40s, sits near the front of the room next to a fatherly older man, 70s. The woman holds a well-worn Barbie-like doll with a tattered sci-fi outfit. The doll somewhat resembles the woman. The woman stares at it, lost in her thoughts, until a speaker takes the podium. The woman straightens up as the man smiles widely with anticipation. Thank you all for coming out today to, to honor the person behind some of the greatest achievements in modern history... As the speaker continues, the woman looks down again at a doll. The speaker's voice fades away. Fade to interior living room day. The time is back in the past, but not long ago. A young girl, pre-teen, the child version of the woman at the ceremony, clutches the same doll in her hands as she fixates on a TV screen, captivated. Everything on the screen is meant to be depicted only as off-screen sound. Off-screen, the sounds of a sci-fi show with the voices of several people including a man, Lieutenant McRaven, and Captain Bologna, a woman. Captain Bologna, the Zoeworg draw closer by the minute, and the Eagle Eye Sky Trekker's light journey system is still under repair. What are we going to do? What are we going to do, Lieutenant McRaven? I'll tell you what we're going to do. Beat. The young girl clutches her doll harder and peers at the screen. She knows exactly what's coming. She mouths the words along with Captain Bologna. We're going to reach up and we're going to fly high. <laughs> Off screen, a door opens, jolting the girl out of her trance. She turns around to see her mom being helped in by her dad, a younger version of the older man from the award room. Mommy? She rushes to her mom, but dad gently keeps her at a distance as he helps mom to the sofa. Uh, give us a second, Luna. As soon as mom is seated, Luna rushes to her. 
Dad focuses on Mom's comfort and prepares pills. Mom is weak, but in good spirits. Are you feeling better? I am now. Dad hands her a cocktail of pills. Mom takes them and swallows painfully. Luna looks worried. That's more than last week. What did your doctor say? Mom pauses. She takes the Captain Bologna doll in her hand and mimics Captain Bologna's voice. What did the doctor say? I'll tell you what the doctor said. She said, I'm going to reach up and, and I'm, I'm going, going to, to fly, fly high. high. Go on now, you'll, or you'll miss the end of Astro Quest. Luna returns to the TV. Off screen, as the sounds of the sci-fi show continue, Luna looks back to see Mom eyeing Dad, who looks away to hide his pain. Luna eyes her doll. She gets an idea and scans the room until she stops in a tucked away container of Christmas decorations. Luna goes to the container and discreetly pulls out a wad of Christmas lights and a few odds and ends, then carries them away. Cut to interior living room day. Off screen, the sounds of incoming spaceships. Luna sits nervously with her Captain Bologna doll watching the show. Captain Bologna, the Zoworg have begun their descent and the Eagle Eye Star Trekker is still grounded. Lieutenant McRaven, prepare the external defense systems. If it's a fight the Zoworg wants, it's a fight they'll get. <laughs> Off screen, a door opens. Luna turns to see Dad pushing in Mom in a wheelchair. She looks even worse, but perks up when Luna rushes to her with the doll. Luna tries to hop onto Mom's lap, but Mom winces in pain. Dad pulls Luna off. Mom mouths, it's okay. No, Linda, it's not okay. Luna, baby, Mom and Dad need to have a, a talk with you. Luna looks worried. Mom doesn't approve of where this conversation is going. You know that Mommy's been sick for a while now, and... And, and you know what would make me feel better? Knowing that Captain Bologna and the Eagle Eye crew reach up, fly high, and get out of the Sevis 261 Nexus forever. Now go. You're going to miss it. Mom ushers Luna back to her show. Luna plops in front of the screen again. Off screen, the alien battle has begun, but Luna's attention is pulled away to behind her. She hears Mom and Dad arguing quietly in the distance. She needs to know. We cannot keep putting this off. I know, Noah. I know. I, I just want her to believe just a little longer before her world comes crashing down. And I just don't want her to be left alone and pick up the pieces when it does. Luna tiptoes out of the room. Off screen, the sounds of an alien battle continue. Captain Bologna, I don't know how much more the eagle eye can take. She's still too weak for takeoff. Hold him off just a little longer, Lieutenant McRaven. I know what to do. As off-screen Captain Bologna races off and the battle continues, Luna creeps back in, pulling with her an array of random household items, bed sheets, snacks, hangers, a kite, noisy toys, a garden hoe, etc. She carries them to the next room. Cut to interior living room day. The sofa is now gone. In the center, in the center of the room, Mom lies barely alive in a hospital bed. Luna is nowhere in sight. Dad sits at Mom's bedside, holding her hand. TV announcer. Previously on Astro Quest, off screen Lieutenant McRaven and Captain Bologna struggle to get the eagle eyed Star Trekker off the ground. Then Luna bolts through the room, frenzied, dragging more household items. She disappears into the next room. Mom perps, perks up a bit, curious. Off screen, the alien battle rages on in full force. Luna dashes through the living room when, off screen, whiz, bam, crash. Luna stops dead in her tracks and gawks at the TV. Captain Bologna! No! No! no. Captain, wake up! Please! Luna looks back to Mom, worried, then turns back to the screen. Please. Captain Bologna. Not yet. Dramatic beat. Off screen, Captain Bologna comes too. Luna lets out a huge sigh and zips out of the room. Mom watches her more closely while Dad is too deep in his grief to notice the competition. Beat. Luna races through the living room with an extension cord. Luna stops again in front of the TV. Off screen, the eagle eye Star Trekker ignites. Do you know what time it is, Lieutenant McRaven? I believe I do, Captain. It's, it's time, time to reach up, up and, and fly, fly high. high. Off screen, the eagle eye Star Trekker rumbles. Luna jams the extension cord into an outlet. Flashing lights shoot out from the next room as a cacophony of sounds 
blends with the off-screen noises of the climax of Astro Quest. Mom painstakingly props herself up. Luna grabs her wheelchair and pushes it to the bed. It's time, Mom. Are you ready? Mom beams and fights back tears. Dad perks up, worried. Luna, what are you doing? Mom is already inching her way into the wheelchair, hiding the pain as best she can. It's killing Dad. Linda, stop, please. Luna, cut this out now. Your mom cannot... N Noah, it's okay. I'm ready. Beat. Dad reluctantly releases her hand. She turns to Luna. I'm ready. Luna wheels her into the next room. Interior spaceship room day continuous. Luna has converted the next room into a spectacular homemade spaceship, complete with flashing lights and noises. Mom's face lights up. Luna wheels Mom through an opening in the ship. Interior spaceship day continuous. The Captain Bologna doll is already seated inside. Luna seats herself in the captain's chair and flips a few switches. Luna's spaceship ignites, rumbles, and shakes. You know what time it is. I do, baby. I do. Hold on. Luna's spaceship shakes furiously as they shoot off into space. Fade back to interior award room day. Return to just a bit in the future. Adult Luna sits still next to her dad, eyeing her worn Captain Bologna doll. So without further ado, please welcome to the podium the first person to step foot on Mars, a pioneer in developing humankind's first interplanetary col colonial system, Dr. Luna Masters. Off screen, a crowd erupts with cheers, breaking Luna from her trance. She looks up to see Dad standing and beaming at her. With her doll, Luna makes her way to the podium. Luna gently places her doll in front of her. Beat. Thank you all so very much for that incredible, warm welcome. I know I get a lot of credit for some of the most recent achievements in space exploration, but there's really someone else who deserves credit as well. Few people know this, but I actually come from a matrilineage of space explorers. You see, my mother was a space explorer too. So if you'll permit me the indulgence, I'd like to tell you all a story about the time she and I reached up and flew high. Fade to end. Astral Quest! Yes, let's all take a mushroom trip to Mars. You guys, that is our show this evening. Thank you so much for coming out.